welcome you all. Welcome to the Institute for Church Life's Saturdays with the Saints lecture series. My name is Lenny DiLorenzo. I work in the Institute for Church Life, and I welcome you here this morning on behalf of the entire Institute, but especially on behalf of our director, John Cavadini, who could not be here this morning. John hates football and has fled to Poland for the weekend. <laughs> Actually, both of those things are true, but they're not related. <laughs> If John were here, he would take this opportunity to recognize the importance and the fittingness of joining together on a Saturday to contemplate the life of the saints. The reason for that, as many of you know, is in the church's tradition, and even in the Jewish tradition, Saturday is known as the ancient Sabbath. And in the church's imagination, heaven will be the eternal Sabbath, where we enjoy leisure with one another, and we spend our time contemplating Christ in the company of the saints who have learned to admire one another. So this lecture series is itself a foretaste of heaven. Uh, hopefully it won't be an experience of eternity, but nevertheless, <laughs> it is an opportunity to contemplate the good of the saints and Christ's light in the world through them. Speaking of contemplation, our particular subject this morning Thomas Merton, you may know that earlier this week, Pope Francis held him up in his speech to Congress as a model of contemplation. Pope Francis is, of course, a close follower of the work of the Institute for Church Life and wanted his speech to be as relevant as possible, <laughs> knowing that this was coming up. But in terms of contemplation, he pointed to Thomas Merton as one who cultivated an openness to God and dialogue with others. Our particular theme this fall is saints who, have spoke, who spoke up and spoke out. And in terms of that openness to God and dialogue with others, these particular saints and holy men and women that we're, ex that we're exploring time with this fall are ones who cultivated that openness to God and dialogue with others in times that were particularly trying when the freedom to do those things was not easy. And a voice had to cry out to make that openness and that dialogue possible. So that's what we will be spending a bit of time this morning exploring. I would now like to introduce one of my former teachers, uh, Professor Sheila O'Regan, who will introduce our speaker, who is another one of my former teachers. So please join me in welcoming Professor O'Regan. start introducing other former teachers. No. <laughs> I am delighted to introduce Professor Lawrence Cunningham this morning, even if I have never called him anything other than Larry. Larry is his preferred title, and Larry is a great puncturer of pretension. Larry is a John O'Brien Chair Emeritus in the Theology Department. <coughs> He taught at Notre Dame for approximately 25 years, was chair for seven, and has been on every committee imaginable in the departments, college, and university. Larry's going to fall asleep at this point. <laughs> Throughout his life, he has managed to publish about 30 books, about 500 articles, and more reviews than can be counted on just about every Catholic topic and phenomenon possible, but especially on Christian spirituality and mysticism prayer, monasticism, and the saints. He is the living Catholic encyclopedia. Or, given the age we live in, he is the Catholic Google. <laughs> Larry is a beloved figure, recalled with affection everywhere. He does, however, present two ferocious challenges to the academic establishment. We academics are the kind of odd people who tend to talk about working very hard. And the trying circumstances that have led to their third book been held up for a decade. <laughs> and what about the tsunami in Kansas? Larry, my office neighbor in Malloy for, well, 10 years, <coughs> had someone perpetually in his office and continually wandered around the hallways. <coughs> He seemed to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and nonetheless, correct the article he wrote in the previous day by 9.30, and had another written by noon. He seemed to 
write simply by breathing, <laughs> provoking in the rest of us lagging behind a protest against in cos cosmic injustice. <coughs> the second challenge is a citation in his CV, very interesting one. Now, the original sin of academics <coughs> is that we are on the lookout for padding our CVs. We have an associate provost who probably is perfectly used to us doing this. Now, maybe this is a fairly general deformation. Now, I haven't quite put in my learned di disquisition last Saturday to my dog Matilda on the topic of prayer, but I seriously considered it for a moment. Larry, whoever, is the great subverter of the padded CV. One entry in his CV concerns book review. This is a book review uh, for Commonweal, of which there were 156, if I recall correctly, on at least six books. That is one entry for approximately 900 books. Now this kind of humility is exasperating. Larry has spoken at this venue before and has given memorable talks on Mother Teresa and St. Francis, on whom he has published at least three books and numerous articles. He has every bit as much, he has been every bit as much a commentator on the subject of this morning's talk, that is Thomas Merton. As is appropriate for this year's emphasis on saints who speak out, the talk on Merton focuses on both Merton's writing about and his public performance of the relationship between contemplation and action. I welcome my colleague, raconteur extraordinaire, and my dear friend, Larry Cunningham, to the podium. When they start calling you beloved, <laughs> You know that you're getting to be a really old man. <laughs> so, I'm glad the Pope gave me a little preview for my lecture today. Get out the Merton notes. Huh? <laughs> So, uh, some, uh, not infrequently, people will email me and ask me, uh, they'll, they'll have heard of Thomas Merton, and they'll say, uh, what, what should I read of Thomas Merton? To which I always say, do you want to read about Thomas Merton, the poet? You could read his collected poetry, which runs to 900 pages. Uh, the Jesuit Daniel Berrigan said, this is not a book you read, this is one that you climb aboard. <laughs> Do you wish to read about Thomas Merton, the literary critic? You can read his collected literary essays that runs to over 400 pages. Do you wish to read about Thomas Merton, the social activist? Uh, we have a number of collections of his writings on peace. Do you wish to read about Thomas Merton, the monastic theorist? We have dozens of essays, some collected um, on monastic history uh, into separate volumes. And now coming into print are the notes that he made for his young monks, which, and this is no exaggeration, I saw this on the table of, at the monastery one time, the mimeograph notes would be about that high. And now they're separating them out and beginning to um, publish them under the general title Monastic Orientation. Do you wish to read about Thomas Merton, the partner in dialogue? He dialogued with uh, people all over the world, and we have five, collect uh, five volumes of his letters. Or do you wish to read about Thomas Merton, the spiritual master? And two of, at least two of his books, I think, are going to be read 100 years from now, New Seeds of Contemplation and Thoughts in Solitude. But I'm going to opt for his autobiographical writings. He wrote five books, one published posthumously, that kind of outlined his own life. Those are Seven Story Mountain, Sign of Jonas, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, 
Vow of Conversation, and finally, Asian Journey. And one of the things I'm going to focus on in this talk, because there's so much you could say about him, is how his own understanding of what it meant to be a monk evolved over the decades. He entered the monastery in 1941, and he died uh, a relatively young man at the age of 53 uh, in 1968. And I'm going to begin with a wonderful little anecdote, not by Merton, but by another very famous Trappist monk of the 20th century, not very well known in this country, but extremely well known in Europe. His name was André Luff. Uh, Merton corresponded with him. And once André Luff said this, he asked the question, what is a monk? And Andre Luf said, a monk is a person who wakes up every morning and asks, what is a monk? <laughs> How do you live your life? Well, the first of the books that I'd like to consider is perhaps his most famous book, but I think not his best book, and that is Seven Story Mountain, which was published in 1948. This was just seven years after he entered the monastery. He was a relatively young man at the time. Uh, he wrote it at the bequest of his abbot. And when it was published, it didn't make a lot of splash. It didn't appear on the New York Times bestseller list. It wasn't widely reviewed and so on. But it began to sell incrementally. Five years later, his editor, Robert Giroux, noted in a letter to Merton that it had sold 900,000 copies in hardback and became one of the great bestsellers in religious history. Now, two things about that story. Seven Story Mountain recounts his birth in Prades in southern France, which was, by the way, the home of the great cellist Pablo Casals. Um, Prades is very close to the Spanish border. His mother was an American. His father was a painter from New Zealand. He lost his mother when he was six years old. He had one brother who was killed in the Second World War. And about his kind of unhappy childhood, he was passed around from pillar to post. He was put into a French boarding school when he was very young, and he was completely bilingual in English and French. Uh, French. Later came to this country. His father went to Bermuda. He lived in Bermuda for a while, went back to England, lost his father when he was a teenager. Uh, he was in a, a British public school, which means a private school, and went to Cambridge University for a year spent that year drinking and chasing women, and uh, was shipped back to the United States, went to Columbia University, and it was at Columbia University that he had this profound conversion experience uh, in the middle 30s, and ended up becoming a Trappist monk. And the book basically ends after he is in the monastery and professed. Now, the two things I want to say about this book, the first one is this, how odd it was that in 1948, a book like Seven Story Mountain should become a bestseller. And the reason I say it's odd is because of the fact that there were some religious bestsellers um, in the air at the time. A, a, a Jewish rabbi uh, Joshua Liebman, who died tragically very young, wrote a book called Peace of Mind, the same year. It was a widespread bestseller. And ironically enough, it's a book, probably because of shock, never mentions the Holocaust. It's a kind of a psychologically oriented book. Fulton Sheen, Remember Uncle Fulty uh, <laughs> from TV? He's not going to give the space to a rabbi, so he writes a book called Peace of Saul, <laughs> which no one reads today. 
But the all-time bestseller of the period was by Norman Vincent Peale called The Power of Positive Thinking. The Power of Positive Thinking. It's a quintessentially American book, upbeat, optimistic, looking to the future, so on and so forth. And then comes this obscure monk in rural Kentucky that writes The Seven Story Mountain. And his book is all about the evils that are in the world, the need for withdrawal, the need for penance, the need for conversion of heart, etc. And maybe it's the after flow of the Second World War that somehow struck a chord um, in uh, people's minds that brought him um, to get such a widespread audience. The second thing I'd like to say about Seven Story Mountain is to mention something about its title. Uh, Merton was a genius at making up titles. Seven Story Mountain, of course, is an allusion to the second part of Dante's Divine Comedy. Dante had passed through the circles of hell and he ends up on the shore of the Mount of Purgatory and he has to slowly climb the seven stories, the seven terraces to purge out, to purgate pride, envy, anger, sloth, avarice, gluttony, and lust. All of these things which, as Dante says in the Purgatorio, are disorders of love. They're disorders of love. And so the opposite vices, the opposite of the vices are ways to attain love of God and love of neighbor. And where do you end up at the, in the end of the purgatory? You end up in the so-called earthly paradise. Now it was a common trope throughout the Middle Ages that the monastery was the earthly paradise. That this was the cloister where one came closest to the, uh, the grace of God. And so, in a way, the title of the book refers to his own journey, because through many fits and starts and sinfulness and so on, he himself then ends up, which at that time he thought was the earthly paradise. This is the center of America, he says somewhat grandiosely. He followed that book with a book called The Sign of Jonas. Now, Jonas is the old translation of the Vulgate Bible. We would say Jonah, but they're still saying Jonas, um, uh, translating from the Latin, where he describes his life in the decade between his entry into the monastery and his ordination to the priesthood. So it takes him more or less through uh, a decade of his life in the monastery. And it's written kind of in the form of a diary with entries and observations and so on and so forth. And I would argue that places in that book uh, contain some of the most powerful prose that Merton ever wrote, especially the epilogue called The Fire Watch, which I wish I was able to, I got to go to the football game, so I wasn't going to bring a book and uh, the notes and everything, um, in which he takes a journey through the monastery itself on the 4th of July, 1951, I think it was, in which he talks about watching the monks finish night prayer, uh, singing, and they go off to bed in this unair conditioned monastery in Kentucky in 1952. And every night, one monk was appointed as the fire watcher. And he, he said he put on a pair of sneakers and he got a flashlight, and his job all night long was to go around the monastery and check to be sure that the place didn't catch on fire. <laughs> 
this was a real threat. The horse barn one time did burn down while he was a monk, and another barn almost burned down. So he kind of sees that night as a kind of an excavation of his own monastic life as he goes from one place to another. And he ends by climbing up the belfry of the monastic church. It's by this time three or four o'clock in the morning. And he opens the door of the belfry to go outside. And uh, I've been to that monastery more times than I care to mention. It's very rural. And he sees this immense black sky with the stars. And as he moves from the belfry out, he says, is this what my death is going to be like? Am I going to come out and embrace this great darkness and this great love of God? And he sits out there and he looks out on the countryside. And he says, God's eye is on every portion of this. The forests and the cultivated fields and the homes of the people and the knobs, what the Kentucky people call the knobs, the hills of Kentucky and so on and so forth. And he mentions by name some of the farmers that live nearby and so on and so forth. And then the book ends with the coming of the dawn and he says uh, the, sweat of, uh, the flight of swallows. But why is it called the sign of Jonas? Well, that's an interesting question. Merton himself gives us kind of an answer to that question. Here's what he writes in the introduction to the book. He mentions that Jonah is a prophet. And he says, a monk can always legitimately and significantly compare himself to a prophet. A prophet is one whose whole life is a living witness to the providential action of God in the world. Every prophet is a sign and a witness of Christ. Every monk in whom Christ lives and in whom all the prophecies are therefore fulfilled is a witness and sign of the kingdom of God. The sign Jesus promised to the generations that did not understand him was the sign of Jonah the prophet, that is, the sign of his own resurrection. The life of every monk, of every priest, of every Christian is signed with the sign of Jonah because we all live by the power of Christ's resurrection. Now the next couple lines are pure Thomas Merton. But I feel that my own life is especially sealed with this great sign, which baptism and monastic profession and priestly ordination have burned into the roots of my being. Because, like Jonah himself, I find myself traveling towards my destiny in the belly of a paradox. That's a very Mertonian line. Now, and I don't want to be a big time professor here, let me just point out that in medieval exegesis, in exegesis of the scripture, Jonah was considered the prototype of the monk. Why? Because part of the Jonah story tells of a man who is inside the belly of a sea monster, hidden from the world, and what does he do? He prays. And the medieval monks loved that image of Jonah in the belly of the sea monster, praying just as the monk in the belly of the cloister prayed for himself and for the world. This is probably the most traditional monastic of his uh, books. That is, it gives you a kind of a sense of what the monastic life was like, a contemplative monastic life was like uh, in the period before the great reforms of the Second Vatican Council. The next volume is called Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Love that title. First of all, 
These are conjectures. Merton himself says that in the composition of this book, he was um, thinking about various issues that had come into his life. And he was trying to think about what it meant to be a monk who managed to live in the paradox of, of flight from the world, but at the same time being deeply concerned about the world. And he has a great intuition that occurred to him when he was in downtown Louisville, <coughs> Kentucky, going to the dentist or uh, uh, something or other. He says, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, actually today it's Fourth and Muhammad Ali, <laughs> a name for that great Louisville citizen, Muhammad Ali. And I've actually gone to that uh, corner, and the state of Kentucky has put up a big metal sign with this passage from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. He said, I all of a sudden realized that I absolutely loved all these people that were scurrying about the city. And he says, the idea that a monk is somehow separate from the rest of humanity is just a crazy idea. That somehow we don't belong to the human race. That somehow we are called, and some of the early monks used to say this, we were called to lead the angelic life as if we didn't have bodies. The bios angelicos. That somehow we were separate. He said, that's an illusion. He says this quite frequently. He says, we are part, he says, we may have a separate vocation, but we are part of this great steaming mass of humanity who uh, 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 make up the vast majority. And then the question becomes for him, and this is one that preoccupies him for the rest of his life, is how does one live as a vowed monk faithful to one's vocation and yet have a concern for the world. And the way he determines that he's going to do it is this. I'm going to be where I am. I'm, I'm going to try to be as faithful to the contemplative vocation as I can be. And yet I'm going to be open to everything that is good in the world outside myself, and I'm going to try to be a person in dialogue. And there's a kind of an explosion in the late 50s and early 60s in which he begins to get into contact with people that he was, um, that he thought were standing up for the best values that were in the world. I can't cite all of these, there are, there are many of them, but the one that I would like to cite is um, that he became very interested in the writings of Boris Pasternak, the great Russian novelist and poet. And interestingly, he became interested in Pasternak not because of the novel Dr. Zhivago, which later became a very well-known film, but because of the poetry of Pasternak, which he happened to run across, and Merton himself was a poet. And he began to correspond with Pasternak. And um, in that correspondence, he also was aware of the fact that Pasternak was being terribly circumscribed and oppressed by the then Soviet government. If you remember, he... Uh, won the Nobel Prize, but couldn't go to Sweden to get it because he knew they'd never let him back in the country. And so he begins to correspond with Pasternak, and he sent Pasternak some of his writings, and some of his poetry, and some of his prose essays. Pasternak wrote back to him. All of this correspondence came via a literary agent in New York. Pasternak would write typically in German, and uh, Merton, who was a polyglot, he, he read half a dozen different languages. 
I got a very funny story to tell you. Can I tell you? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I edited his personal journals uh, for publication, journals between 1952 and 1960. And, you know, he would quote French and he would quote Latin and quote Spanish and little fragments of Greek sometime and whatnot. And I could kind of bumble my way through those in German, some of the past books that was in German. And one day I'm transcribing the journal and he says, I think I'm going to learn to read Russian. I thought, oh, God, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not Russian. Um, there are limits to my uh, abilities, but he never took it up. He also thought about learning Chinese, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that either. So he wrote a letter of support for Pasternak. Now, all of a sudden, the abbot general of the Cistercian order gets wind of all this, and he's saying, what is this crazy American monk doing, getting himself in the Cold War politics of literature and so on and so forth? And it was kind of unheard of. There had, been, there had not been monks who typically did these sorts of things. And this was to cause him some problems because he would soon become extremely interested in the anti-nuclear movement of the day and the racial turmoil of the time. And he began to write on this. He was a very close friend of Dorothy Day, another person mentioned by the Pope in his talk to Congress. And he begins to write on this. And this <coughs> caused horrendous consternation within the community itself. Uh, the Abbot General sent him a note once, and he quoted an old monastic line, it goes, I guess goes back centuries, officium, uh, our officium es plungentis non docentis, our office is to weep, not to teach. So, but Merton's trying to think of how does that fit in with the monastic life? He said, I know everybody's not going to be able to do this, but if you have these gifts, why should you do it? Also, he was considered to be a lefty by J. J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> a friend of mine has gotten his folder, the FBI secret folder on Burton, because he seemed to be talking to these dangerous people on the left uh, for peace and one thing or another. But he continued... Um, in that vein, but when he was told, you may not publish, when the censors of the order said you can't publish, he didn't publish. I mean, he was, um, and one of the monks who knew Merton well said, Louis, that's what they called him in the religious life, Louis was a supremely obedient monk. But he did something very interesting. He would, he would, put his essays on mimeograph. Remember, this is pre-Xerox and everything. <laughs> remember those old blue sheets? He would, he would, people of a certain age remember that. He would write these essays out, crank them out, and just mail them out to people. <laughs> this is exactly what they did in Eastern Europe, by the way, the dissidents in Eastern Europe. And he called these essays the Cold War Letters. The Cold War was between himself and the Abbot General and so on and so forth. He, he would never publish the stuff. That, that stuff later has subsequently been published. And that brings us to the title of his fourth book, which I think has got a hilarious pun in it. Uh, the fourth autobiographical book is called A Vow of Conversation. Now, in the monastic life, if you're a Benedictine monk, one of the vows that you take is conversatio morum. We would say conversio morum, a conversion of manners. Morum means manners. A, a conversion of, the way of, of your way of life. Uh, Benedict, for some reason, used the word conversatio, which may, literally means a conversation. So, Merton, in this title, 
refers to that monastic title. But at the same time, he refers to the fact that he wants to converse with the world, uh, with all of these people with whom he is, um, with whom he is dealing. Um, so it's at this period that after some years in the monastery, he gets permission uh, to uh, leave the community and become a hermit. This was a, uh, this was a common enough thing to do uh, in the monastic life. Not so common among the Cistercians, but uh, in, the, in Russian and Greek Orthodoxy, monks that live for a certain amount of time, they're permitted to go and live a solitary life. And in Vow of Conversation, he talks about his desire to do this. And he says that what he wanted to do with the rest of his life was the following. To live in silence, to think and write, to listen to the wind, and to all of the voices in the woods, to struggle with a new anguish, to live in the shadow of a big cedar cross. There was a big cedar wooden cross up at the hermitage. To prepare for my death and my exodus to the country, to live, uh, to love my brothers and all people, to pray for the whole world and to offer peace and good sense. This is my place in the scheme of things, and that is sufficient. Amen. Well, Merton himself was a bit paradoxical because as soon as he gets this uh, hermitage, he decides that he'd like to travel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a very famous, maybe the most famous monastic historian of the 20th century, uh, Jean Leclerc, a Benedictine monk from uh, Luxembourg, uh, had a meeting planned uh, in Thailand uh, to bring together Christian contemplative monks and Buddhist monks. And he invited Merton to come. Merton knew a lot about um, Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm sorry, Eastern monasticism. And so the new abbot, uh, uh, Dom Flavian, whom I knew a bit, uh, gave him permission to do this because he had not traveled at all during his life. And so he flew to California, and this is typical of Merton. He stayed with the uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the founder of City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco, which was the epicenter of the beat movement, uh, and um, then went to Asia. And he was in India, gave some talks in India, <clears throat> went to Dharamsala, <clears throat> and um, had two sessions with the Dalai Lama. Uh, the Dalai Lama was a young man at that time. He was like 35 years old. And the Dalai Lama subsequently came to visit and pray at Merton's grave uh, in Kentucky when he would come to the United States. It had been a number of times. And... Um, Towards the end of the, they go to the conference. The conference wasn't going well. It was the first and only time in his life that Merton was ever televised. There was a Dutch TV journalist, and he, uh, he managed to get this conference that Merton gave. And it, it's kind of eerie in a sense, because at the end of it, Merton said, I think this after, the program calls for this afternoon for us to have discussion so I will get up and disappear. And he went back to his room, took a shower, went to plug in a fan that was a defective wire, got hit with a shock of electricity, died of a heart attack. Uh, and they shipped him back, ironically, in a plane that was carrying dead American veterans <coughs> from the Vietnam War, and sent him back to the United States. <laughs> one of the old lay brothers at the monastery said to me one time, that's what Father Lewis gets for traveling around the world. If he had stayed in the monastery, he'd still, still be with us. You know, the, these old brothers, they didn't go for all this traveling and talking to Buddhists and so on and so forth. <clears throat> 
So, subsequent to his death, they published the notebooks. He was a inveterate <coughs> keeper of notebooks. They published the notebooks with the title Asian Journey, kind of a prosaic uh, uh, title, and he never would have called it Asian Journey, but it has uh, the story of all these travels that he did in Europe. Now, I'd like to do I'd like to do two things here, if I may. Uh, one is I'd like to, uh, I'd like to read how Merton himself envisioned um, the uh, way in which he conceived of being a monk towards the end of his life, and this came about in the following fashion: a collection of his writings were translated into Japanese, and he was asked to write a forward, a preface to the volume, uh, which he agreed to do. And it was called Honorable, he addressed his readership, Honorable Readers. And he knew that very, very few Japanese were Catholics or Christians, very small percentage of the country. Although they have a strong contemplative life among the Christians, there's a Trappist monastery in Japan and a Trappistine monastery for, for women. So he wrote, he, he felt he needed to write something to explain his crazy life as a, as a Trappist monk to an audience that really wouldn't understand it too much. So he wrote the following preface. And I think this very well sums up what I'm trying to get as the contemplative as activist at the time. He, he says this. But the monastery is not an escape from the world. On the contrary, by being in the monastery, I take my true part in all the struggles and sufferings of the world. To adopt a life that is essentially non-assertive, non-violent, a life of humility and peace, is in itself a statement of one's possession. But each one in each life can, by the personal mode of his decision, give his whole life a special orientation. It is my intention to make my entire life a rejection of, a protest against, the crimes and injustices of war and political ty tyranny, which threaten to destroy the whole race of uh, humanity and the world with it. By my monastic life and my vows, I am saying no and he writes capital NO, to all the concentration camps, aerial bombardments, staged political trials, judicial murders, racial injustice, economic tyrannies, and the whole socioeconomic apparatus, which seems geared for nothing but global destruction. In spite of all of its fair words in favor of peace, I make monastic silence a protest against the lies of politicians and propagandists and agitators. And when I speak, it is to deny that my faith and my church can ever seriously be aligned with those forces of injustice and destruction. I believe it also involved by many who believe in war, believe in racial injustice, believe in self-righteousness and lying forms of tyranny among Christians, my life must then be a protest against these also, and perhaps against these most of all. If I say no to all these secular forces, I also say yes to all that is good in the world and in humanity. I say yes to all that is beautiful in nature, and in order that this may be a yes of a freedom and not of subjection, I must refuse to possess anything in the world purely as my own monastic poverty. I say yes to all the men and women who are my brothers and sisters in the world, but for this yes to be an ascent of freedom and not of subjection, I must live so that no one of them may seem to belong to me and that I may not belong to any of them. Monastic celibacy. It is because I want to be more to them a friend that I become to all of them a stranger. That's a very nice statement and a very mature understanding of, of uh, one's position. Now, 
a lot of writings of Thomas Merton are, are autobiographical. And I read this guy for 40 years, and written about him, and so on. But he's also very elusive. He almost never tells you anything about his own interior life. But there is one big exception to this, and it's so typical of Merton that it comes in a letter that he wrote to, of all people, a Muslim living in Pakistan who was a Sufi. A Sufi is a kind of a monastic, kind of monastic brotherhood in Islam. Anyone who was a Sufi would be right up there with the Christians that ISIS would hate. They, they think they're, they're off balance. They would be axed as soon as anyone else. So this Sufi, whom he never met, uh, this guy got his name and address from a very fr famous French Arabist the scholar, uh, Henri Massignon. And he wrote to Merton, and they exchanged letters uh, back and forth for a couple years. And <clears throat> finally, Aziz asked him, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what's your life like? And so Merton describes his, his daily life up in the Hermitage, etc. He gets up, uh, he says, at uh, 2 in the morning and says some psalms and he works and meditates for so on and so forth. And then he has this paragraph, which I think is extremely moving. So you ask me about my method of meditation. Strictly speaking, I have a very simple way of prayer. Now remember, he's writing to a Muslim who knows nothing about Christianity. This guy, by the way, himself was a working class man. I think he was a train conductor or something. That is to say, it is centered on faith by which alone we can know the presence of God. One might say this, given my meditation, the character described by the prophet, that is by Muhammad, as being before God as if you saw him. Yet it does not mean imagining anything or conceiving a precise image of God, for to my mind, that would be kind of idolatry. On the contrary, it is a matter of adoring God as invisible and infinitely beyond our comprehension and realizing God as all. My prayer tends very much towards what you call fanna. Fanna is an Arabic term which means forgetfulness of self. It's a Sufi term. There is in my heart this great thirst to recognize totally the nothingness of all that is not God. My prayer is then a kind of praise rising up out of the center of nothing and silence. If I'm still present myself, this I recognize as an obstacle about which I can do nothing except unless he himself removes the obstacle. If God wills, he can make the nothingness into total clarity. If he does not will, then the nothingness seems it to itself to be an object and remains an obstacle. Such is my ordinary way of prayer or meditation. It is not thinking about anything, but a direct seeking of the face of the invisible, which cannot be found unless we become lost in him who is invisible. I don't ordinarily write about such things, and I ask you, therefore, to be discreet about it. <laughs> and luckily we have that letter. I'm going to make a final point, because I know people have read Merton, at least some people in here may want to ask questions. Uh, here's an interesting question to ask. <coughs> Why is Merton still read so much today? I mean, this is the centenary of his birth. He was born in 1915, and I've been all over the place giving talks on Merton. I have two more to do, one in Colorado, one in New York, and I'll, I'll be grateful for the centenary year to be over. Um, <laughs> so why is it that people still read this guy and uh, get so much nourishment on him. And it's amazing how, uh, what an effect he has on people. A couple of years ago, I was in Kalamazoo at the Medieval Congress, and they had a, a special 
event on Thomas Merton, and I gave this talk on Thomas Merton, and after the talk was over, this young woman came up to me, and um, she worked at the Catholic Worker House in Milwaukee, mainly working with abused women who were undocumented, so they couldn't go to the police or anything. They had a little shelter for them, and they took care of the kids, and so on. So I said to her, well, I'm a huge fan of the Catholic workers, and I said, to me, it's an ideal way of being a Catholic. And she said, oh, I'm, no, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, she said, I, I'm not sure I'm anything. I said, well, how did you end up at a Catholic worker house? She was a student at Bryn Mawr, pretty posh school. <laughs> it was an economics major and was going to take over her father's company. She was going to go to work for her father's company after she graduated. And she said, when I was a junior, someone gave me some Thomas Merton to read. And I read this and I said, gosh, there has to be something else to do with one's life besides manufacture widgets or whatever it was that they were manufacturing. And so she said, I made some inquiries and learned to, through him about the Catholic workers. And that's, that's how I ended up in Milwaukee working with the Catholic workers as soon as I graduated. I could multiply that story a um, hundred times. And I think people of a certain generation, my generation, for example, uh, entered re religious life or entered monasteries or became priests, etc., uh, deeply under the influence of Thomas Merton. So, but he's been dead since 1968. Still, books still sell, still being translated into other languages. So I ask the question, why? What, what's his secret? And I think the answer is an answer which is very similar to why Francis is so popular today, Pope Francis. He writes and speaks with a clarity and an authenticity that is totally free from what I call church speak. If you notice when Francis was here in this country, he didn't quote his venerable predecessors and didn't use that kind of Vatican jargon that just kind of is a, a, a sludge um, that um, does not make, um, he doesn't speak like an encyclical. He speaks directly to people in simplicity. And I think Merton's writings have that same quality in a different way. So I'm gonna end right now by simply quoting something that Merton said. It's never been published. I transcribed it off a tape I found. He used to give these conferences to the monks. This is quintessentially the way Merton thinks. He says this. Life is very simple. We are living in a world that is absolutely transparent to God and God is shining through it all the time. This is not a fable or a nice story. It's true. If we abandon ourselves to God and forget ourselves, we see it sometimes, and we see it maybe frequently. God manifests himself everywhere, in everything, in people and in things and in nature and in events. It becomes very obvious that God is everywhere and in everything, and we cannot do without God. You can't do without God. It's impossible, simply impossible. That's nice. Thank you all very much. I think for maybe two or three questions, and maybe we'll give priority to those who don't spend most of their time here at Notre Dame and would have a chance to talk to Professor Cunningham otherwise. So for the visitors, maybe first. Oh, uh, well, I wouldn't know the visitors from the natives, so I'll just take this <laughs> okay. I'm, a, I'm a visitor from, uh, let's see, California, Texas, Chicago, Nebraska, Center. I've been to Merton's grave. My dad was a lifelong fan of his for over 60 years and got me into it. I'm one of very few Vietnam veterans, 
uh, during the war, I went to a Trappist monastery near Hong Kong. Yeah, Lan Tao. Lan Tao. Yeah. Okay, met the monk there. And uh, I'm so delighted that you're, you're here today. I read some of his books, and uh, what is my question? Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I heard that he fell in love with a nurse uh, you know, before he went to Asia. Have you heard about that? Oh, have I heard about it? <laughs> now, he became infatuated with a nurse. Um, well, it's going to be one of the reasons why it's going to be tough to get him through the canonization process. <laughs> um, and and um, she was a younger woman. Uh, until a few years ago, she was still alive. But uh, he saw after a very short period of time that this was just a crazy thing that he had got himself involved in. And uh, he broke it off and remained in the monastery and remained faithful to the monastery. The only thing I'd like to say is, and this is only going to be useful for people of a certain age, you've got to understand how crazy the world was in 1967, 1968, when everything was in turmoil. And I think, I think this was a man who never had a family life. He was like Erasmus in the sense that the church was really his only family. Uh, the monastery itself was in turmoil at the time, and so on. And so he fell in love, and then felt that this was incompatible with being a Trappist monk and ended it. But of course, Big Merton, in, in, he incessantly wrote about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering if you could say something about his relationship with the Trappist monks. Um, you know, it's interesting that he seems to have been a very um, What was the guy's name who uh, darkened his face and skin and then... John Howard Griffin. I'm sorry? John Howard Griffin. John Howard Griffin. He was also an ace photographer and a, a brilliant musicologist. He was supposed to write Merton's biography. He gave Merton a camera, and he took to the camera uh, very well, and a lot of his photographs have been published. He was also a very accomplished uh, artist. He, uh, he, he, he did cartoons for the Columbia uh, yearbook, and we have a lot of his drawings, uh, some of which have been shown in exhibitions. Um, his best ph photographs have tended to be of inanimate things like uh, uh, knobs on trees or uh, things of that nature. Very, very few people in his photography. That's a kind of an austere photography. But there's a volume of those photographs available. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm a visitor from Miami and, and the Lake Cistercian. And uh, in reading uh, some of uh, Merton's autobiographical work, I, I forget which one it is, he makes mention of a desire to become either Kamal Lelis or Carthusian. That's in Sign of Jonas. And, and I wonder how you would reconcile that with his desire to be an activist. Yeah, well, I, he went through this period up until 1958, roughly about 1958, in which he, had, he wanted a more solitary life. And he thought about the Kamaldolese. They were not in this country at that time. Later, did he thought about the Carthusians, Exxon, uh, and he actually wrote. I know this part of his story very well because it's in the journals I edited. He wrote to Rome and asked to be exclaustrated, and he was going to go to Nicaragua and live in blue fields. This was a crazy idea. This guy couldn't drive a car. He couldn't, you know, he, he would have he would have died in the jungles in uh, like uh, two weeks. <laughs> so he he wrote to Rome and asked to be exclaustrated to go lead a, a simple, more solitary life. Rome piddled around with this and then sent him a letter back. And when the letter came back, Merton took it, didn't open it went into the novitiate chapel, sat before the Blessed Sacrament, and opened the letter. And in his journal, he says, Rome said no, <laughs> wisely. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Next line, I must find solitude outside geography. In fact, I wanted to call that volume of the journals by that, those three words, solitude outside geography. Anyone who's ever published knows you never win battles with uh, publishers. They said, no, uh, never sell if you call it that. Well, no, I thought it was a beautiful line, but that was, that was his way of dealing with that. Do you want to do one more? I'll, I'll do as many How about as... about one, one more because we're about at the end of time. Anyone have a... Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is, how did he earn the privilege of travel and have access to books as a Trappist monk? Yeah, um, through the abbot. Um, the, uh, the books were never a problem. I mean, uh, Cistercians have been writing since the 12th century, so they always had access to books. Etienne Gilson, the great medievalist, has a wonderful line about the 12th century Cistercians. He said, the 12th century Cistercians gave up everything for God except the art of writing well. They were brilliant Latinists, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux and those people. Um, Trappist monks would travel when there was necessity, like, the, uh, like if they had to go, if they went to visit other monasteries or they, were, they needed to go to you know, one place or another. He himself did almost no traveling until the last year of his life. And he went to Alaska and California looking at future monastic sites. And then the ab abbot Flavian gave him the right to go to Asia. But most of the monks don't, don't travel that much. Maybe we'll stop there because we're about at the end of time. Wow, what a... I know. Mm -hmm. gift to thank Professor Cunningham for being here with us. This is an advent calendar, which I don't know if you'll believe this coincidence, they're actually selling in the bookstore, but <laughs> <laughs> it's an advent calendar with the image of Our Lady of Mercy, which is the stained glass up in our chapel upstairs and get us off. If you haven't seen it, you should uh, maybe just step in the chapel on the way out to look at it. Um, so we would like to give this to you. Oh, thank you. You'll join me in thanking 